Now, you've written a number of books uh, on ethics as well, uh, and ethics and politics. Uh, usually when I see ethics and politics in the same sentence, I reach for my wallet. <laughs> uh, but at the end of the chapter titled Conspirators, you have your character Jonathan talk of the abuse of office in politics, those who care only about power. Uh, how do the characters in your novel reflect your own views, and is there anyone in there that does seem to be your stalking? You know, in, in the chapter you mentioned when Jonathan says that he's in a conversation with Abigail was talking about this very famous view of Charles Finney that he's put in a lot of his sermons and writings that you need to construct a politics that will elect to office the men of the best moral quality. He didn't, he didn't simply mean, Finney, that you need to find people of high moral quality. He meant the people who are the most moral should have the most power. That was Finney's view of how democracy mm -hmm. ideally should work and should be the only thing you can account in the voting booth is who is the most moral individual on the ballot. That's mm -hmm. who you vote for. That was Finney's view and that's what Abigail is talking about. And looking back, we'd say it's a little bit naive and I suppose it is, but I think character matters a great deal and should matter because in politics, as the media tells the story, what matters are the issues, you know, and, and of course the occasional gaffe. But in the end, what matters in our leaders often more is not the issues we could think about, we could imagine at the time of election. It's the unexpected ones that arise the next year. That's what really tells you the difference in different politicians. And that's where character really matters. And one of the things in my judgment that makes up good character is the ability to reflect, the willingness to reflect. We live in an era when the media presses for short, immediate, snappy answers. Imagine a debate a presidential debate in which one of the candidates said, you know, that's a tough question, I need to think about that. People would say he's evasive, he's dumb, he's not fit for office. I would say he's doing the right thing. I would like all the candidates to offer, answer every question that was asked in debate by saying that's a tough question, it's a hard question, we should spend more time thinking about it. I can't answer that in two minutes or 90 seconds or whatever they get. Uh, and I'm not a cynic about politics in the sense that I think there's no one in politics who is a good character can be reflective. I think the enormous pressure on both sides of the aisle, from the media, from interest groups, makes it hard to be reflective, makes it hard for people's good character to come to the fore, because more than ever before, every word you speak, every negotiation you enter into, every effort you do to get a bargain in the back room is immediately all over the internet. You have no maneuvering room, and you can't really, people of good character can't accomplish very much in that world, no matter how much they really want to, because they'll be drowned at the next election if they step off, if they step beyond the line um, by just a little bit. And that's a tragedy for politics, but I don't there blame our politicians, I blame us for treating politics as a spectator sport. We have to follow every move and every word of every politician as soon as it's spoken. Study it, massage it, criticize it, don't let people get away with anything. I think that's actually very bad for our politics. So is that bad for our democracy? I mean, how are we going to have a thriving democracy in something that is a light to the rest of the world if we're in the, you know, in, in the divisions we are today? Last time it led to civil war. That, that's a tough question. I don't know the answer to that. If you go back to Lincoln's day, politics weren't any nicer. They were nasty. They were very nasty. But it wasn't anybody's full-time job. That If you remember the public, the voting public, which was smaller, of course, in 1860, yeah, you were nasty toward people on the other side, but for a couple of weeks a year. It wasn't 52 weeks of politics. You weren't constantly thinking about the next election cycle. Maybe if you were some political boss in some big city, you might, but otherwise, you were the rest of the time living your life. Politics wasn't a hobby the way that it is now. I will tell you one thing. I don't think the world was better than the 1860s. Clearly, it was much worse. But there's one thing they knew that we forgot. Remember the 19th century? There was this long tradition that lasted up to the 1880s. Um, that if you wanted to be president, it was beneath your dignity to campaign. That's uh, all grand. Other than, other than uh, Andrew uh, Jackson, uh, who people thought it was vulgar that he went out seeking votes, there there was an understanding that the, uh, they remembered that the president is not only the head of government, but also the head of state. And the, the notion that someone would campaign actively, go out on the husting seeking votes for head of state, I thought it was beneath the dignity of the president. I actually agree with that. I think we would have better quality politics if the presidential candidates disappeared from the time they threw their hat in the ring to election day. How are we going to judge your moral character then? You're going to judge people's character 
by whatever means you can that don't include simply watching them give speeches and picking apart, well, look, he's put these words wrong. This didn't doesn't look at how outrageous this is the way he said that. I can make a big deal of that on the internet and on television of these misplaced uh, uh, words. And both sides do this. This isn't a partisan thing. Um, I, it, I don't know if it'll be harder to judge people's character than probably, but it reminds me of something Lincoln said. You know, Lincoln said, I don't, don't remember now if talking about what the accusation was um, about which uh, Hay and Nicolay record him as saying, uh, recognizing the book is a little bit romantic, they're romanticized, but record him as saying, um, basically, uh, uh, by now, you can't answer an accusation like that, by now my character is well established. Yeah. If people believe I'm the speeches. kind of person who does that, nothing I say will matter. If they don't believe it, then there's nothing I have to say. And, and you know, that kind of patience, I think, was characteristic of Lincoln. You mentioned Herndon's view about how thoughtful he was. He was thoughtful, but he was also patient. His view was give things time. He didn't think you had to have the answer today or you failed in your job somehow. And that, I think, we'd be much better off with. I often remind my students... Pearl Harbor was attacked in 1941. The definitive report of what went wrong was published in 1962. It's not that there weren't a lot of interim investigation reports, but not until 1962 were we really sure we got it right. Sometimes it takes a while to figure out what went wrong and to figure out whose fault it is, and, and so on. That could take a long time. And we don't have patience. No, we don't have patience. I mean, that's, who knows what that is. Technology certainly is part of that. That's not going away. And uh, so that... 15 minutes of fame is now down to three seconds. Well, but you know, one of the things that's wonderful to be sitting here in this beautiful bookshop is, is books, serious books, I mean, are the antidote, I think, to a lack of patience because sitting there with an actual physical book in your hand, turning the pages, working it through, turning it back, th reflecting on it, is actually, I think, an aid to developing thought. I'm not saying you can't do it with an e-book. I'm, I'm not saying that, and, and I'm not going to argue that you can somehow keep that future from coming into being. Um, but, but whatever it is, that, that thoughtful reading of something that's long and complex and challenging, I think helps develop those, the, the notion of patience and thoughtfulness in sure. a way that the kind of quick and easy books that are so sure. popular across a variety of fields really don't. Well, I mean, that, there's a whole other subject about uh, books and e-books, and I'm not against e-books, and I see reading still very much alive. Yes, absolutely. The, the platform may be different, but it is different, too, at least right now. You can't do with an e-book what you're talking about with a real book. I can't do, I couldn't have done this today with an e-book. I have to be able to go back and forth and through and remind myself of something and, and other books and nonfiction that go to the index and go back to something. And you can't do that in an e-book uh, as readily right now. Okay. So for real research and thoughtfulness, I think you still do need a book. But, and I agree, e-books are great in a lot of ways. I mean, yes, so when I'm are. traveling, like on book tour, yeah. uh, it's much easier for me to have several books on my iPad than to carry several books in my very small uh, carry-on bag. There's no question. Um, but books in their traditional form, the touchability of a book, which is something that Ray Bradbury actually used to talk about, uh, was that books were meant to be touched, uh, he used to say. Uh, and interestingly, there is some evidence, I say some, because it's contested in neuroscience, that, that you experience something differently when you're able to touch its pages um, than when you look at it uh, on a screen. The tactile record of it that. makes you process it differently. Although right. Some neuroscientists dispute this. Some think it's artifactual. Some think it's important. I, I know, it's not into, my field. I don't know. It's into a state of mind, does it not? I mean, doesn't that help? Just to have a book and feel that I mean it, there is maybe we're dinosaurs. Well, but there's, there's something else also that that again you that that here's a, an important difference. If um, I had a student a few years ago who wanted to do a paper, she wrote a very fine paper about the views of the Puritans in the 17th century in Connecticut on a particular issue, and I sent her all that stuff. All these sermons are all available online, but I sent her to the Yale Rare Book Library to hold them in her hand. And she came back to me, and she was so excited. She said, do you know I had Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, in my hand this morning, you know? And it makes a difference, how, especially when you interact with history, when you can touch something and feel this is touched by this person and this person and this person all through history. I think it's a remarkable and well, that's wonderful That's what's thing interesting about lose. artifacts as well that we, we have here and why people do buy them, because then... It, you can't have everything in a museum. And 
the, the artifacts that collectors purchase and take home with them are embedded into the community. They'll go to their historical society, or they'll go mm -hmm. to the library, or they'll go to their kids' classes, and they'll bring these things. And most of the time, it's the first time someone, certainly a young person, can, can have a Lincoln letter in his hand and touch mm -hmm. it, or have a life mask and really feel it and see what Lincoln was in that sure. regard. And uh, it, it does make a different feel to the person and how they interact with history when they're actually interacting with history. It's absolutely true, and it's interesting. So in, in writing um, this novel, and I said I did a lot of research, and some of it I did do with various um, books and various collections that I looked at digitally online for a lot of the history or the speeches of August Belmont, things like that. But when I could, I preferred to touch books and hold them in my hand rather than um, look at them online. Well, I'm going to have you begin some work here and sign oh. while I say uh, hello and thank some of the people that have uh, already uh, purchased books. Dorothy in New York, New York, uh, Joan here in Chicago, and Les also here. Norville in Louisville, as always, thank you, Norville. Uh, Daniel in Beaver Dam, Stuart in Littleton, New Hampshire, Eric in New York, Harold in Possville, Pennsylvania, Dan in Downers Grove, Roy in Lebanon, Tennessee, Douglas in Louisville, Kentucky, Todd in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, Jim in Brown Deer, Wisconsin, Archie in, in Minnesota. We thank all of you and others who have uh, purchased books and helped us continue getting uh, highly, highly known authors and good authors here with us. Um, upcoming virtual book signings. Here, I'm going to give you a few more to keep going with. And you'll see some to inscribe, so you just okay. inscribe that as well, please. Uh, upcoming on August 15th, coming right up at 3 p.m. in the afternoon is the Bicentennial of Fort Dearborn here in Chicago. Uh, we'll have Gilliam Ferguson with his book, Illinois in the War of 1812, and Donald Hickey and Connie Clark as The Rocket's Red Glare, a wonderful book I think you'd enjoy as well. August 15th, Wednesday at 3 p.m., uh, join us for this 1812 war. Uh, now, the next one is going to be at the end of September uh, with James McPherson, uh, The War on the Waters. I've told you about that. So Thursday, September 27th at 6 p.m. Central Time, James McPherson will be here. We also have him uh, at some of our venues here in Chicago, the Pritzker Military Library, the Union League Club, and we'll have him up in Kenosha, Wisconsin at the Civil War Museum there. So look at our website and you'll see all of those there uh, if you'd like to go. Uh, the Friday and the uh, 28th is going to be both the Union League Club and the Pritzker uh, Military Library. Saturday, September 29th, the Civil War Museum in Kenosha, but here, September 27th. And then Friday, October 5th, uh, 6 in the evening, Richard Slotkin, A Long Road to Antietam. He'll be here. And then December 6th, uh, a Pulitzer winner, uh, John Meacham with his Thomas Jefferson, uh, his new book. This is the proof of it. And I think uh, you're going to enjoy this. I just got into it a little bit. And of course, John Newton is a terrific writer as well as, as you are, for that matter. I want to tell people that even though this is the dreaded novel, Civil War People, this is a fascinating book. And I think you will find this a, turn, a page turner quite a bit. And you might enjoy this read as much as, uh, uh, as David Donald, for that matter. So I want to thank Kanaf for bringing you in and for you joining us today. It's a wonderful discussion we had. It's my uh, pleasure. Thank it. you it's much. Good book. And I want to thank all of you who have come in. If you want to meet the author afterward and uh, get into signed books, please do. Mm -hmm.